Good morning. I went looking for the word that uh, is used to uh, define, describe, or to name uh, test anxiety or a, a fear of tests. And I did a little Google search, and the first word that popped up, I thought, well, that can't be it. That's a made-up word. Somebody is just making a joke. And then I did a little more research and found out this is the word. And here it is, testophobia. (laughs) That's really it. I thought, you know, it would be some Latin-y name, but this is it. And here are the symptoms. So if, if you don't like taking tests versus being afraid of taking tests, See if you have these symptoms, headaches, stomach aches, nausea, diarrhea, excessive sweating, shortness of breath, lightheadedness or fainting, rapid heartbeat, and dry mouth. If you experience those when you're thinking about taking a test or taking a test, then you have an actual clinical testophobia. There's good news for you though. There is a medication. Unfortunately, the side effects include headaches, stomach aches, <laughs> nausea, diarrhea. I have noticed that there are people who really enjoy taking tests. You know, a lot of us, you know, we're not afraid of them, but we don't enjoy them. But there are some people, they love to take tests. They, and they don't want to just take the test. They want to beat the test. They want to crush that test. There's a name for those people too. In the Latin, it's spelled weirdo. And, <laughs> and maybe you know some people, they just, they just live for this stuff. And, and some of those guys that, that make up, I think, part of that group are, uh, we call them, there's a group of them in the military called Navy SEALs. And you may be familiar with that organization, and the SEAL stands for Sea, Air, and Land, and that's, they're able to operate in all three of those kinds of environments. And the training that it takes to become a Navy SEAL, first off, you have to be very physically fit just to get into the program. But then the the training, the conditioning that it takes, especially in their first phase, is some of the harshest that modern man has come up with. And rather than just describe it to you, let's watch a video of an actual, uh, what it kind of looks like, and then we'll talk a little bit more. Who's ready to enlist? Whether we're facing a a test of the body, the mind, or the spirit, our ability lies in the mind. The instructors who lead these men through this process know that the human machine is capable of amazing endurance, even the harshest of conditions and environments. But they also know, and this is key, the mind must be able, must be made to ignore the pleading of the body. Now hear that again. The mind must be made to ignore the pleading of the body. It's not In a lot of these cases, you look at these guys, you know, there's not a paunch among them. These are very physically fit guys. Oftentimes, it's not their bodies giving out, it's their minds choosing not to go on. And for us, when we face hard seasons, challenging seasons, tough seasons, for us often, it's the battle is in the mind. Will we keep going or will we quit? And we're going to look at that as we begin our study in the book of James. Now, James, if you're not familiar with him, he was a half-brother to Jesus. He was a leader in the Jerusalem church. And he was an advocate for a very practical Christianity. A, a book that, is a, that keeps encouraging us to prove our faith with our obedience and our servanthood towards others. Now James, in his emphasis on what we do, should not be seen as a, as a contradiction to Paul's teaching on salvation by grace. 
Because he's not talking here about our salvation, about earning it. He's talking instead about our faith and living it out. It's a reminder that grace is not a license for laziness. Grace is not an excuse for indifference. And he begins his letter, we'll pick up in verse 2. We read this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now think through that just a little bit. James had this kind of this Navy SEAL attitude, or at least that's what he calls us to, to, to push through in the difficult seasons, in the challenging times. You know, often when we go through a, a rough season, a hard season, we, we tend to want to think, well, God doesn't care about me anymore. If God loved me, God wouldn't let me go through this hard season. He wouldn't let me feel and face the pain that I'm in. But rather what James is trying to get us to see is that instead of looking at this as a lack of God's involvement, but to see it as an opportunity for our growth. Notice here that the word that he uses, uh, perfect. And we, we hear that word perfect, we of, often think of flawlessness. But there's something else happening here. There's a, a different idea behind this word in the, in the Greek. And it has the idea of maturity, of fulfillment, of seeing the thing all the way to the end. Uh, imagine it this way. Imagine you come up with your perfect vacation. And your perfect vacation is to get in your car and to drive that great American road trip all the way from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Pacific Ocean. And so you're cruising along and you're having a good time, but you get to New Mexico and you say, eh, seen enough, I'm done. Will you have seen it through to fulfillment? No. And so it's less than perfect. Not because everything went well on the trip, but because you didn't see it all the way through. Now, the idea of completeness that's used here also has the idea of getting everything that's been allotted to us. Here in our country, uh, we kind of guarantee you a high school graduation or high school education. And there are certain outcomes and certain things you're supposed to experience and there certain things you're supposed to, to learn and know and understand. And if you do those things and engage in the process, you'll come away with a high school education. But if you start skipping classes, not doing your homework, or just drop out altogether, you will not have received everything that has been allotted to you. And so this is what James is trying to get us to see, is that God wants to do a work in us, a work through us, a work for us. And when we go through challenging seasons, these trials, these tests, when we go through them, that is him working those things out. Is he causing everything? Not necessarily. But what we see is all the, whenever we go through these tough times, these challenging seasons, these trials, we are having an opportunity to stretch ourselves, to grow ourselves. And so it's a, it's a mental decision that we make to see these things as an opportunity for growth rather than an opportunity to stop or to quit. And that's essentially what James is telling us. Don't stop. That when you face this trying time, don't stop short. Don't quit. Don't give up. We have an old expression that you've probably heard. No pain, no gain. Do you know who popularized that phrase? Jane Fonda in her 1982 workout videos. No, I haven't been watching them <laughs> and engaging them. But somebody else said it before she did. Benjamin Franklin. 
He said, there are no gains without pains. But before him in 1650, a poet by the name of Robert Herrick said, if little labor, little are our gains. Man's fate is according to his pains. There is something that happens in growth that when we are growing, it can hurt. It can be hard. It can be painful. And the temptation will be to run away from that, to avoid it at all costs. As I was graduating from high school, one of the great choices, you know, college, what, what do you, job, what are you going to do? And there was the military. And I had some friends who were going to the military, and I thought, no, I don't want a mean man yelling and calling me names and telling me to do push-ups. I'd already had 18 years of that with my dad, and I didn't want to keep doing that. That didn't look like any fun to me. But God calls us to move forward and not to run from these painful seasons, but to see them in a different light, to reframe them. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to keep in mind that these things are not contradictory to what Jesus has to say. Jesus said some things like this. If, if you want to follow me, Jesus said, Pick up your cross. Now, he wasn't talking about a little gold cross on a gold chain. He was talking about a big wooden cross that was an executioner's tool. He said that if you want to be great, sacrificially and humbly serve. If you want to live to God, you're going to have to die to yourself. That's all hard stuff. But it's the way in which God works within us. So what's this call to action? Keep getting strong. Focus on that word there, keep for a minute. Keep at it. Keep it up. Keep moving. When you get knocked down, there'll be those times. Get back up again. Will you be tempted to quit? Sure. Don't. Keep moving forward. Keep getting strong. Don't give up. Let's go a little bit further. Look at verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose they will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, a stable in all his ways. So one of the things what we're being called to do here is to kind of stabilize ourselves. And one of the ways we do that is to ask trustingly in God for something specific like wisdom. Now, how is God going to give us wisdom? I think there are three ways that he provides it for us. First off, Scripture. Read the Bible for yourself. Don't, don't just say, what will I do today? Oh, I'll read this. Put a plan together. Just start somewhere. Start in a gospel. Start in an Old Testament book. Psalms, Proverbs, Genesis. Pick something and just keep working along. And as you're working through the scripture, make observations. Just write some things down. Questions you might have. Things that are interesting to you. And then look for those application points. And then pray about it. Another way that we are uh, given wisdom, I believe, from God is through counsel. One of the wise things to do is to ask somebody who is where you want to be for their counsel. When you're faced with a decision, a choice that you need to make, when you're, you have a dilemma, talk to somebody that you consider to be a wise person and say, here's what I'm thinking. Can you help me think through this better? Don't be afraid to seek out wisdom through counsel. Sometimes that might be with a professional counselor who's not going to tell you what to go do, but will help you work through and understand what's driving you and what your options are. The third way that I think God gives us wisdom is through observation. 
Sometimes we have to just observe our own behavior. It should only take you one time touching a hot stove to know that you shouldn't touch a hot stove. It should only take you one time touching an electric fence to go, that's a bad idea. We should learn our lessons as we go along, making note. But we can also look around and see the behaviors of others and what people are doing and decisions they're making and make some observations about what is working in life and what is not. Especially people who are seeking to follow Christ with their whole heart. Try to look for what's working well for them and how they approach life. Talk to them. Make your observations. Now, as you make your observations, you want to make some corrections, but you don't want to overcorrect. You know, if your car is driving down the road, and if you come over and you, you let two wheels get off to the side, off of the road, the last thing you're supposed to do is yank real hard and oversteer, overcorrect. Sometimes we do that in life. We have a bad experience, and we say, I'm never doing that again. Some people won't come into a church because one time they had a bad experience in a church. Some people got their hearts broken. I'm never going to love again. Some people tried to make some friends and they ran into some mean girls or some bad boys. And said, well, I'm never going to try to have a, a friendship again. That's overcorrecting. Correcting is learning from the experience and making a good correction. If you were to fail, it's learning what caused the failure, what led to it, and then making those adjustments. So what we need to do is keep getting wise. Keep pursuing wisdom. Keep at it. Let's go on a little bit more. Take a look at verses 9 through 11. Let the lowly brother <clears throat> boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Now, this is interesting. In, in this first section of James, we're kind of given an, an overture, an overview of where we're going in this letter. And one of the problems is that there were some very rich people and some very poor people in this church. And they were giving a lot of deference to the rich people to the detriment of the poor. He says, for the sun rises with a scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. There's a lesson here for us that we need to do. We always need to keep checking our perspective. Keep checking your perspective. The call of man's culture favors the rich, the beautiful, the powerful. But James says, that's all temporary. That's all temporary. You can have a beautiful flower one day, scorching heat the next, and then it's gone. It's all so temporary. So be careful about that. It's very fleeting. Here's something I want you to remember. We're, none of us are getting out of here alive unless Jesus comes back first. So what are we taking with us? I want you to keep in mind, you can't take stuff with you. You cannot take stuff. But did you know you can take people? You can invite people into the kingdom of heaven. You can in introduce them to Jesus. And you can see them with you when you're in heaven. So where's your perspective? Where's your focus? What are you choosing to make priority in your life? Think about those things, James says. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. As you watch these Navy SEALs, one of the things where maybe you notice that there were some helmets kind of lined up. And if someone decides to quit, they go ring a bell and they put their helmet down and they leave. The difference for whether they succeed or don't succeed often is what they choose to do, 
whether they will continue on or not. And James says, remain steadfast. Keep standing. Now, we'll do that by God's grace. We keep trusting in God's grace. We're not earning any of this. This is all happening through God's grace. But we have to make a decision to stand strong, even in the midst of the hard times, the challenging seasons of life, and the growth opportunities that come our way. Look at a little bit further. Look at 13 to 15. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt or be tempted with evil, and he himself tests no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin, and sin when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I've noticed something over the years. I've heard people say something to this effect. Well, if God didn't want me to have this thing or be with that person, he wouldn't make me to feel this way. And we confuse feelings with faith. Let me, here's something you just take hold of. God does not operate through our feelings. You may feel like doing something that is adamantly against the word and will of God. But just because you feel it doesn't make it right. You may not want to go do something. You may not feel like doing something that you absolutely should according to the word of God. Our feelings follow our thoughts, and our thoughts need to be transformed, renewed by the Word of God. So don't let your feelings lead you to places that God doesn't want you to go. God has a Word and a will for us that we need to discover and explore, and it's going to match up with this. So in the midst of all of this, we have to learn something else. Let's look at 16 through 18. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Or his own, for his, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What does that mean? Well, what we see here is we need to keep trusting. We need to keep trusting in the goodness of God. When you picture testing, you, you, you may picture that kind of a pass-fail, get a grade, it's good for you, your future, or, or it's bad for you. But the Greek word behind this idea of testing and trials is one of, of proving in, in this sense, you know, maybe you've heard of proving grounds. The military has proving grounds where they take their weapons out and they, and they tr try them out and they blow things up and they want to see what works and what doesn't work. Or race professionals have test tracks. And, and they do these things, they go to these places and they conduct these trials not to wage war or not to have the competition, but to look for structural or design flaws that need attended to. And that's a great lesson here for us. You may think you're in really good shape until you have to do two flights of stairs in a row. Or three or four, whatever it takes. And suddenly, you're, maybe I'm not. Or you really think you have endurance until you chase a preschool around all day long. It's when you... Your faith seems fine when all is calm, but get some resistance, get a tough season, and suddenly you find yourself doubting and wondering and questioning. And those things aren't there to wash us out. Those are there to show us what needs to be attended to, what thoughts are there that we need to challenge. What are some falsehoods we need to get rid of, and what are some truths that we need to to embrace. And that's what James is telling us here. That when you're going through these seasons, through these trials, 
through these testings. It's not that you're trying to prove yourself worthy of God's love, but rather you're seeing where you still need to grow, where you still need to transform. So look for those things. Don't run from the trials. See them as God at work in you, teaching you, growing you, maturing you, perfecting you. But understand, it's not going to come from these mountaintop experience. It's not going to come, you know, just in attending a seminar on something. It's in the day-to-day, mundane, practical stuff of life that we experience these things. And that's why our series is called Practically Perfect, using the practical stuff of life to mature us each of us, whether we're just starting out on this journey of faith or we've been at it for decades, we all need to keep moving, keep growing, keep persisting in what this is all about. So as we work through this letter from James, I encourage you to be here with us each week. It will push you. That's okay. It'll challenge you. That'll be all right. We can use some of that. It won't kill us. We can get stronger from it. The reformer Martin Luther called James a a straw letter. He didn't like it at all because of James' emphasis on work. He didn't think it pointed sufficiently enough to the grace of Christ. But what I think he missed and what we easily miss is that in every moment in our lives, we need grace. We have to swim in it. We have to breathe it in. In fact, the next breath you take is an act of God's grace in your life. So don't be afraid to run from it. We imagine God's grace to be about forgiveness. But instead, we need to see it. it is the fuel for our lives as believers. I've got a psalm I want to leave you with that we can read together. When you're going through a challenging season, and some of you may be right now, this is a great psalm to go through and and just use as a prayer. Let's read it aloud here together as, as a prayer. Say with me, how long, oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, one of the wonderful things that I noticed in that video of those, those young men training is how important it was for them to work as a team. And that same is true for us, Father, that, that we learn to rely upon one another. So that when we feel weak, we have a brother or sister come along and give us encouragement to remind us that we can do it. So, Father, I'm thankful for that. Right now, Lord, we just ask in your name for you to speak to each one of us. Whatever season that we find ourselves in, if it is a season of trial, of of testing, of, of struggle, Lord, remind us we're not alone. Remind us that we have you and we have our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for taking time out of your day to watch this week's message. I hope it really encouraged you in your own walk with God. 
if you heard anything in the message and you'd, you'd like to speak with someone or if you'd simply like to connect with someone on staff, we'd be really excited to hear from you. Please feel free to contact us at the email address or phone number below. Otherwise, thanks for watching.